Hello travelers and welcome to Adventures in Security. This is the second in a set of two videos in which I describe zero trust principles and architecture. If you still need to watch the first video explaining the principles, I recommend you watch it at the link in the video description. This video on architecture will make more sense if you understand the principles behind it. The script for this video, formatted as a study guide, is also available in the video description. Even if we don't call them zones, we have created them for years. We create a security zone whenever we create a VLAN segment and apply a VLAN access control list. We traditionally enable access to zones for any subject. A subject is a combination of a user, an application, and a device that has passed a single point of authentication. Access to devices within the zone also requires a single authentication and authorization step to gain access and then maintain access for the day. But this all changes with Zero Trust. To review, the Zero Trust objectives we're trying to reach with our infrastructure are based on the recommendations of NIST Special Publication 800-207, entitled Zero Trust Architecture, the link to which is included in the uh, video description. So first, all data sources and computing services are considered resources. Anything that we access is a resource. All communication is secured regardless of network location. Access to individual enterprise resources is granted on a per session basis. Access to resources is determined by dynamic policy. This dynamic policy includes the observable state of the subject's identity, application, and device, the subject's behavior, time of access, day of access, geographic location of the subject, the classification and categorization of the resource being accessed, and anything else that the administrator uh, controls with policy. The enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. All resource authentication and authorization are dynamic and strictly enforced before access is allowed. And finally, the enterprise collects as much information as possible about the current state of assets, subjects, network infrastructure, and communications, dynamically adjusting session-related risk. The bottom line, we always assume that our network and all connected devices are compromised until analysis proves different. As shown in this NIST graphic, any time a subject attempts to access a resource, its components must be reassessed to determine the associated risk of a session at that point in time. It doesn't matter if the subject had previously had a session open with the resource, it is no longer active. Each session request requires a risk assessment based on session characteristics like subject identity, application and device, subject behavior, time of access, geographic location of the subject, and the classification and categorization of the resource being accessed. We've already covered this. We achieve these objectives by implementing a zero trust solution. Solutions vary, but they should all provide the basic operations I describe later. The components of a zero trust solution include a policy decision point or PDP, which determines if a subject or an element of a subject has a risk level below a threshold set by the administrator. It can also direct that a session be dropped. It does this using two functions, the policy engine and the policy administrator. The policy engine or PE uses a data store with aggregated and correlated information including input from Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Systems, or CDM, that gathers information about the health of the subject device, including patch level and installed software. An industry compliance system that applies rules needed for regulatory or industry requirements. Threat intelligence feeds. Security Information and Event Management, or SIM. Data access policy set by the administrator. Public Key Infrastructure, or PKI, used to issue and validate subject certificates. Identity and Account Management, IAM, system 
that enables relevant levels of subject authentication, user behavior, and subject behavior overall. It also uses session attributes that can include the user's role, time of day, day of week, classification and categorization of the resource, location of the subject, device owner, device health, and the application being used by the subject. Using the collected information, the PDP determines if a session is allowed and the level of privileges granted. The Policy Administrator, or PA, sets up the session based on the decision made by the PE. The Policy Enforcement Point, or PEP, establishes and tears down sessions based on the instructions from the Policy Administrator. A PEP can be software agent on subject devices or a hardware, or hardware appliance or both. Let's walk through a simple example. Our subject, with an authentication token for the network, wants to access the enterprise resource. As we've seen, the subject is initially assumed untrusted. The PEP blocks initial access, sending the request to the PDP. The PE looks at the information it has about the identity used by the subject and the resource and determines if the subject can have access as well as the level of access. Since the subject is using a company-owned device on the company network and the subject device's health is fine, the behavior of the subject and its components is within acceptable parameters, and the subject's role allows it, the PE provides the PA with its risk assessment and access approval. Based on the PE analysis, the PA configures access with the full privileges granted to the user's business role. However, lesser privileges are likely if a subject, for example, is on a public network. We use security zones to control resource access. A security zone is a perimeter that surrounds one or more resources, as shown here. It can be created with a next-gen multi-homed firewall, a Layer 3 switch, or a multi-homed PEP appliance. Technically, it is the security zone to which the PE grants access. This is an example of using a PEP appliance or PEP-enabled next-gen firewall. When Alex attempts to connect to the financial server from the internal network, she's directed to the PEP. The PEP sends the request to the PDP. The PE grants permission. The PA configures the session and the PEP grants access to the server. Note that each server is in its own security zone. Every time a subject attempts to access one of the zones, it is reassessed by the PDP given that each session is terminated at the end of an authorized workflow period. For example, Alex finishes with the financial server and then attempts to access the patient care system. Her session with the financial system is dropped and she is once again sent to the PEP. The PEP does not grant access just because Alex had previously been cleared for financials or just for general network access. Instead, it initiates the approval process as before. Every time a subject attempts a new transaction with a resource, it must go through this assessment process. Grayson attempts to access the patient, patient treatment system from home. He's assigned to the same role as Alex. However, the PE sees that he is on a remote network when he has passed through the assessment process. Based on policies configured by the administrator, he is granted access with fewer privileges than those given to Alex. Ethan, Alex, and Grayson's manager attempts to access the financial system, but when he goes through the assessment process, the PE discovers that the SIM has provided proof of anomalous behavior by the device. Because of this, the PE denies access. This might occur before the security team even sees an alert on their SIM portal. Configuring the infrastructure to enable zero trust is a function of the solution you select and your network's existing infrastructure, including cloud resources. And implementation does not have to be all or nothing. Most organizations have already segmented their networks for security reasons. Even though strict zero trust focuses on protecting individual applications, 
It can also be used to control access to existing resource clusters on VLANs or other segments, segments protected based on the associated risk. That's it for this video. If you have questions, please ask. And if this information was helpful, please subscribe. And until next time, be careful what you click.